Hello and welcome back to another one in our How It Works series. Uh, we did a couple of these with Yoad and Navo, who's there in his studio in uh, London, Navo Sound. Uh, how you doing, Yoad? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Glad to hear yeah, it. I'm good. And uh, you're not going for the full uh, sort of... Uh, um, crazy man uh lockdown beard you're keeping it kind of fairly trim and uh just you know yeah i try my best yeah, yeah good plan <laughs> um so last couple of episodes that we did uh we looked at uh, a couple of other aspects of kind of how what what's going on behind the scenes with certain technologies and it proved really successful and it's uh, really pleased that you know, has agreed to do some more of these and um so this time what we're looking at is fm i mean i know it's a very big subject but for many people it's a real alien art you know people just don't understand it at all and i put myself i mean i i kind of get it but i don't get it if you see what i mean i kind of slightly understand it but i don't understand it well enough and we're going to talk to yoad today because yoad as you know is uh a developer for Waves as well, and has also been involved in the uh, 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 the production of an actual FM instrument, which is called Flow Motion. So he kind of gets it, I think it would be fair to say. So it's your task today, if you choose, is to explain to us mere mortals how FM works on a basic level. Yeah, I'll try to do my best. Um, so a lot of people know how FM sounds and uh, they're familiar with the sound because it has a very distinctive sound, but not many people know how it actually works. And that's what we're going to try to do today. It's quite a complex subject, and I'll try not to get too technical. Um, basically, what it is, it's uh, a signal, if you imagine an oscillator, um, modulated by another oscillator. And let's demonstrate it. And we're going to actually break some myths um, surrounding FM today, um, which hopefully will be interesting. I'll try to make it interesting. Um, it, okay, so if you imagine we have a sine wave. And then I'm going to try, I, I just have a, a frequency modulator which means that I'm changing the pitch of this uh, sine wave oscillator and my LFO is another sine wave right. so this sounds very familiar sorry let me let me make it slower yeah we all know how that sounds and you know if I increase the depth it does that and now if I speed it up to audio and I'm trying to and I'm starting to get into audio frequency territory then we get these interesting sounds which we sounds like starting to sound like FM however um, now if I get it you see it's it sounds quite inharmonic yeah but if i if i manage to get it to, to to sound quite pleasing but then when i move the pitch of the fundamental of my carrier it all goes wonky again like, yeah it go, yeah obviously on the fifth it will sound quite nice on the on the octave it will sound nice because it's just multiplication multiplication of the same frequency so the the terms of um, of fm relate to the carrier so that's my carrier and that oscillator is my modulator right so the more i let it modulate with this is basically the depth the more it sounds fm -y. But as you can see, it's not very usable. So here we're going to break the first myth. When we talk about FM, which stands for frequency, frequency modulation, actually it's not. Um, usually we actually refer to phase modulation, uh, which is PM, if you like. Um, so... Let's start with uh, the first 
the first product that came out was the DX7. It came out in 82, uh, and it was developed in the late 70s um, by Yamaha uh, and released in 82. Um, even though it's called FM, their take on FM is quite different. It's, called, it's actually linear frequency modulation, um, which, which they have a patent on it which basically eliminates that inharmonic right, okay. sound. And, and I'm going to try and show how this is possible with phase modulation. So let's start. This is, so this is flow motion. Flow motion is a kind of flexible... FM synthesizer because on the DX7 for those who are familiar with it or Dext which is uh, like the plug-in version FM8 FM7 they're quite a few they have fixed algorithms so you have your carrier or carriers and you have your modulators and they're set in a different way so which one modulates the other yeah. the, the carrier or carriers this is this is a, a more flexible design because it allows you to actually design your algorithms. Ah. So this is a, here. So that's a sine wave. And now I'm going to use FM frequency modulation like we saw just before. And I'm going to increase the amount of FM. Right. And now you can hear that what happens is as I increase the amount, the, the, the pitch goes up. And that's because the, the sine wave frequency, the, basically the frequencies are logarithmic. So if I'm taking a, a, a sine wave and I'm modulating it by another sine wave, um, Let's say I modulate, I'm taking one kilohertz and I'm modulating it by 100 hertz. So the relationship between the up phase and the down phase will be different because if I'm modulating it upwards, so the, the pitch up will be 10%, but the pitch down will be more. And that, therefore, when I increase the amount of modulation, Pitch will appear to 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 go up, um, so that kind of makes FM straightforward, like simple FM, quite unusable. Mm. And what most manufacturers tend to do is to use phase modulation, and this is what the PM stands for. And what that does is instead of modulating um, the pitch of the carrier it actually modulates the phase of the carrier by uh, the modulator, which in this case is a sine wave. And this sounds more... So you get that FM sound. That's just and increasing the higher, the, the higher harmonic sound. It's not actually... It's not sort so of, it's not imprinting the pitch of the carrier so much on the on the sound. Right? Exactly because it's only modulating the phase, right, and not the actual fundamental of the of the of the carrier. So so now I I can control um, the the shape of the harmonics, and if you like, this is a distant cousin of oscillator sync. Um, because it it doesn't change the fundamental pitch of the carrier oscillator, but it changes the phase, and that's why it sounds a little bit kind of um, comb filtery, because it messes with the time, if you like. So, what happens if you change the pitch of the modulator now? Okay, so, so now, so this is a straight, so here you see the architecture of FM, uh, of uh, flow motion. Basically, we have four oscillators, 
and each one can modulate each of the other ones. You see these virtual lines here, and this is the amount that this one modulates this one, this one in turn can modulate this one or this one. They can all modulate each other, and that's why the, the architecture is quite flexible and it's not like fixed to uh, specific algorithms like on DX7 and its uh, predecessors. Yeah, so now this is a straight level of the modulator going into modulating the carrier but i can run it through an envelope so if i drag an envelope here then i can shape And that starts. All oh, right, that sound, that sounding very familiar, FME to exactly to a lot of people, I would imagine. Yeah. So that's go through goes through an envelope. I can I can do it. Uh, and I can run it through um, an LFO. So if I drag this one here. So is is just a question there? Is the pitch of the modulator being affected by the keyboard, or is that a fixed pitch that you've got in the modulator signal? Uh, so it can be either, because here I have the keyboard tracking. So let's let's just mute all these and go for straight for straight level. So now it's following the keyboard, but I can have it. Oh, okay. And then again, it becomes kind of inharmonic. Um, so yeah, so it has to follow the, the pitch of the keyboard because then it retains the relationship between the modulator and the carrier. Right. So this is quite important. Um, for certain sounds, like percuss percussive sounds and all these metallic sounds, sometimes we, we don't want it to do that. So if we go for just envelope, right, and we, you know, so... So if ah, the good old lo the good old log drum I hear there. there exactly. <laughs> okay, one more one more question about the relationship with. So is it is it necessary because if the if if in an original DX7 if the pitch is being tracked on the carrier and the modulator, is the does it follow that the inharmonicness is less so because they're both tracking the keyboard or are they fixed? Um, exactly. That that's that's kind of quite crucial so but i suppose I, I suppose the question is then why does it need to be phase modulation if you track the keyboard of both the carrier and the modulator because you you can get different characteristics so if i'm not following the keyboard let me exaggerate this you know if i want to get like those kind of percussionist sounds so you can see that the you can hear that the transient kind of stays stays yeah constant while the pitch, pitch yeah. while the yeah while the pitch changes but if i do track the keyboard then we get this familiar kind of uh, fm bass sound let's go lower and this is get th that. and this is quite a simple algorithm, isn't it? I mean, just that it's very basic. Level. This we're is just, just, just two, two. This is just two oscillators. So one carrier, one modulator. Sorry, we're still getting those clicks because the modulator is had no release. Then it changes the pitch very rapidly, and that's the click we're hearing. Ah, okay. Something to bear in mind then. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's quite delicate, th this whole thing. So this is a very simple, it's just two oscillators, one carrier and one modulator. Now, with this, um, in the early days, in the early 80s, when DX7 came out, the computing um, power were uh, only enabling the use of sine waves, and they had to deal with that, and all that they had eight oscillators, in different kind of arrangements, and that's what they had to use. Um, these days, obviously, 
we have more computing capabilities. So we can actually, instead of taking care of all the harmonics which enrich a, a given sine wave, we can actually use different waveforms for both the carrier and the modulator. So this, so that's a sawtooth. Well, that's something that uh, Yamaha did with some of their later models as that's well, didn't it? They did that with the... Uh, exactly. Yeah, the, and that and that really opens it out. I mean, I should also point back, um, there was something you mentioned earlier. The DX7 wasn't necessarily the first FM instrument. It was the first widely available commercial instrument, I would say. I mean, because it, it yeah, sold sure. hundreds of thousands, didn't it? I mean, it was massively successful. Absolutely. It was massive, and it changes because it, it, it really introduced the, the sound of FM, which influenced the 80s sound immensely um, that, for me as also as a, as a mixing engineer i i can um, see two major influences that were introduced by yamaha in the 80s one is the sound of fm the Dig dx7 and the other is the ns10 speakers uh, the near field uh, monitors which were um, widely used by mixers and they had a very distinct sound which also contributed immensely uh for the for this 80s sound uh but that's maybe for an, a different episode uh, another episode um so yeah so when i use a a, a sawtooth let's let's take the fm off so that's a sawtooth let's go for it back to um triangle because i think it's there's too many harmonics and then you know so now we have a much more harmonically rich um, sound and if i go back to sine wave but now i change the modulator to you know so i with just two oscillators i can I can make very, very complex sounds, not to mention the um, fact that I can then modulate it by another one. So we're sort of getting into what, what we're sort of getting into there, the, 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 the concept that we have with the preset algorithm with the routings and the feedback going between specific uh, exactly. operators. Oh. Only here I can I can do it in a much more kind of open and flexible way because now I can let's say I can modulate this by um, an LFO, but it's a, at the same time I can modulate. Do you remember we have this? So I can, with the same oscillator, I can actually modulate um, the the modulator. Well, these are you very, know, so the, can, yeah. These are very familiar. Uh, starting to be very so you familiar. Get, FM, you so. get it exactly. So you get it very. So you get it very quickly. Now here, you can see that it's quite tinny. So I can at at the on the higher keyboard range so then i can eliminate the keyboard tracking i need to lower to compensate yeah so you can get all these sounds very quickly if i if i um reset this now what i can do is another very familiar kind of DX sound, which is the this electric roads or electric piano sound. And that is achieved by having a very, very quick kind of if I'm trying to emulate the, the tines of the of the fender roads, which is what they used to do. So I'm gonna grab an envelope. Set it to a very Again, I need the release time. And then I uh, make it very high. Uh, Even something that like that. Tick. Make it. Interesting seeing these done. All oh, right. Yeah, absolutely. 
it's interesting seeing this done because I mean, for many people, they instinctively know what to do with a, a subtractive synthesizer to achieve a certain kind of sound. You know, you go, you reach here for this. With FM, it's much harder because you don't necessarily know what it is that happens to make that kind of sound. So you have to, you have to sort of you understand have... that initially. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, but that's why that's why when we designed flow motion, we wanted to to eliminate the the need of kind of planning and thinking stuff in your head and then check uh, changing the algorithm to suit that. But we wanted to have something which is more kind of hands on experience. We just turn knobs and things happen. So. Um, yeah, and obviously, if I if I then set this to to be um, to respond to velocity, and I set the overall envelope to be something which resembles more a piano, yeah, you know, so all these sounds. Um, obviously, you can also create something which is more like, um, let's go back, like an organ, because you can create something, and this is something that the DX7 is very um, famous for as well, which is just um, additive synthesis. So I'm, so I'm just introducing harmonics. And I'm going to use this oscillator. Ah, so you're not using any feedback at all. You're so, just basically adding no, up sides. Uh, so adding that's up editing. Sides. Yeah, and and you you can control uh, you can control it via octaves and normal tuning semitones, or by the actual harmonics, which makes it very easy. So this is this works now like a Hammond organ. You know, so these are the draw bars, if you like. But then you can introduce some FM. So if I if I apply FM, you know, from this to this, or from this one, yeah, so this is more like a far tra <laughs> transistor. <laughs> transistor yeah, yeah, like a transistor organ. But then, not to mention that I can use different waveforms. quite loud but um yeah so so this is a now if we let's go back to another simple um two oscillator fm and again it's called fm but it's actually phase modulation uh, and if you look at the korg method because they couldn't step on yamaha's patent so they called it v VFM, um, ah, right, okay. variable phase modulation. So they're actually using this. Um, the Casio FZ1000 um, uses phase distortion. They're all kind of related. It's the same sort of principle. Uh, and that, that's all done from I mean, the initial work and kind of concept by John Chowning. That's where they, all this sort of came from, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, the, the, it was very academic in the early days because uh, they didn't have, it's all digital. So it's it's one of the first methods of digital synthesis that was ever available. And if you think about it, that was late 70s, even earlier. But but when they when uh, Yamaha started working on the DX7, I, I suppose it was the late 70s because it must have taken them a few years to to develop it until it was ready mm. for release in 82 and um, they use some um pre-calculated tables to to take the load of the processor which was very very primitive at the time it was 8-bit um, and that's why you get those kind of uh, metallic you know, um, overtones and all this kind of dirt. Because I guess because uh, that, that would have been get... it would have been aliasing, wouldn't it? There'd have been aliasing coming into it. Yeah, it's 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 aliasing, but it's also the low bit rate because right. it's all eight bit. So so you get a lot of quantization error, which makes it um, without dithering, uh, which makes which kind of mod again modulating um, kind of 
riding on the signal to create this um that's interesting um, so the out early digital is kind of actually you know so later presumably later fm uh it's much higher resolution and higher higher quality sounding because it's it doesn't have or it has less of that right exactly which doesn't mean necessarily that it sounds better because um mm. i love i have quite a few i have a dx7 obviously i have a tz what's what's it called T, T, uh oh i can't tx81z yeah exactly which is a four oscillator mm. one i have the fb01 which at the time was a cheap, I think it was the first multi-timbral mm. um, synth to ever come out. Uh, it had three parts, um, eight parts, and it, it, it's uh, four, os um, four oscillators. Um, this is the lo Logic's take on, uh, I know I keep mentioning Logic um, plugins because they're so simple and so effective. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this um, has got to be, what, 15, 20 years old now, this guy? <laughs> something like that. And it just sounds... So, again, so here... So here I'm adding the FM amount, but I can use it through an envelope. You see here, they have the release all the way up to, pre to prevent the clicking. So immediately... So you get that that UK bass. Oh wow, yeah. You know, straight away. And this is just two oscillators. There's a carrier and um, and a modulator. And here again, you can take out the keyboard tracking. So it becomes less harmonic. Whereas here, it follows it better. It's got an immense... I mean, even though I'm, I'm listening to this remotely, I mean, when I get the original audio files, it, it's got massive amounts of low end. I mean, it's really thunderous, isn't it? I, I have the default... I made the default preset, which is just... Crikey. I mean, it's just the sound that you want, really. Yeah. When, you, when you're talking about FM bass. At the time, it was meant to kind of imitate or emulate real sounds. You know, you remember those flutes oh, yeah, and those um, even pianos, you know. Did, were they introducing uh, noise into that as well to create those sort of the, the breathy and the chat? Or was that just other? Sort of, or so the sort noise, of... yeah, the noise is actually introduced. They didn't have a dedicated noise generator. Let me let me initialize this again so you can create noise by something that sounds like noise by using feedback so if i'm um, if i'm modulating um a sound by itself yeah oh, so gosh, basically yes. now i'm sending the oscillator to modulate itself so you get something which is so harmonically rich that it's so whitened, if you like, that it the, the harmonics are actually, let me just lower the level, uh, that the harmonics are actually greater than the fundamental. You know, and this kind of, that's how you create noise, right sort of noise oh, uh, you know if you remember the the famous kind of train preset on yeah. the dx7 preset <laughs> used it on so many like records that. i'd imagine no yeah i didn't must have done like me <laughs> yeah yeah so um, mm, that's interesting i mean in this the thing is about this is i mean this we're, most of these examples you've been sharing have been two operators and that's just that's the thing that kind of gets really mind blowing mm -hmm. is when you start to see the interrelations between all of them. That's when it starts to get exactly. Insane. Let's yeah. If we go to the to the to the kind of welcome preset, if you like, of uh, of oh, that's reconfiguring here... itself on the fly by the looks of things. Exactly, because here we have the preset sequencer because uh, we, we can change. So this is a, a preset sequencer. So we have 16 presets, and we kind of change it between them seamlessly. 
and it kind of right, right, okay. mutes and unmutes oscillators and, and things like that. So, the, yeah, modern days computing allows us to, to design very complex um, sounds and presets and, and a way of changing between presets on the fly and things like that um, to create very complex sounds. Let's see if we have... Um, so I imagine the cha the challenge here is, you know, because I know Richard Devine's really heavily into FM and he's, you know, you've got to devote the time. Yeah, we to... have some of his. Uh, oh, you've got, he did some of that. His... Right, okay. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it's about the nuance, isn't it? Because you can hear as you're sweeping through, you know, like you're, you're putting 100% of a modulation and then, but all of those little bits in between is where the nuance is. It's, and it's very it's... delicate. It's very delicate. Yeah. It's like, it's almost like, getting the right amount of drive on your Minimoog or something like that, you know? Um, so here I have some kind of very... So sounds like that, which are very familiar. And they allow a lot of ex expressibility or expression. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because also the depth of modulation, what we're used to hearing in uh, analog synthesizers, there's usually a limit to the amount of modulation you can you can add to any uh, from any source. And sometimes it feels like it's not quite enough. Whereas with FM, it seems like you can go way further than you'd ordinarily go to get you know, real extremes. When, when we designed flow motion, we had to limit the amount uh, because it can go way out of any proportion right uh, very quickly and and it can and we have to we had to use uh, up sampling and stuff like that because you go to ultrasonic um frequencies very very easily it's so you know so um yeah uh, so that's kind of the story of fm uh, very briefly it's interesting and, uh... it, it, one thing that's very interesting is that the the amount of uh, potential that there is here i mean we often hear you know people who are exponents of uh, fm say oh it's only just scratching the surfaces in many ways you know it's just it, it's making it more accessible and i guess flow motion goes a, a long way towards that you know where where do you think that the that it, it's not been explored. I mean, because you've obviously been deep into it because designing an instrument, you're going to go through all, a lot of things that it can do that most people won't be exposed to. Where do, Where is its real strengths? What's the sort of, what's the stuff that you think it could do that maybe we haven't really been exposed to too much? So here, because it's so flexible, we only had four oscillators. But if you imagine having um, 20, 64, 128 oscillators and all the kind of interconnectivity and intermodulation between them then the sky's the limit really because then it, it it has enough it will have enough complexity to generate any sound right with the like if you had six even 16 oscillators with a dedicated envelope to each one and the kind of flexible routing the thing is that it will be a nightmare to program. The reason that uh, maybe um, modular synthesis and analog synthesis has become so popular over the last 10 or 15 years is because I think it's become de-nerdified. You know, it's been, it's come into the mm -hmm. lexicon of, of music creators. People understand a filter, people understand an envelope. So some of these things are gradually getting down to sort of the level of consciousness that most of us mere mortal musicians can deal with. It's an FM still feels very esoteric because it's, because it's so complex, and I suppose that's the challenge, isn't it, to try and make it even less complex? Yeah, and um, and I have to say kudos to to Guy Rotem who first came with this uh, concept and designed um, the basically the the basics that the, who designed the, that synth really. Uh, there was a big team of 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 us at Waves, but he came with the concept of simplifying and making FM accessible um, and to get kind of out of the limitations of the fixed algorithmic um, sort of, yeah. you know, grid and to make it accessible. So it's like a, a hands-on 
uh, experience, which is more familiar to people who you are used to tweak knobs on on SH one hundred and one and mini moves and stuff like that. So that it, that was uh, his vision. It's interesting, isn't it? Even even simplified though, there's still some complexity, or still you know, it's yeah. quite complex. Yeah. You have to you have to kind of have a certain mindset uh, to work with it. But since there are so many presets, you know, there's like hundreds and hundreds of, them, of presets suppose, yeah. here. You 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 can just go select something and you know and start playing with it not to mention that we have a like a you know modern day uh, filter section filter envelope all these modulators envelopes fm uh, sorry envelopes lfos one shot lfos you know effects and stuff like that so so it it makes it more familiar to yeah. to yeah, everyday. Excellent. Synthesis. Well, I mean, the, the intention really wasn't to make this a kind of uh, a, a, um, a a a, pl a plug for flow motion. But I mean, in terms no, not at all. It, but but I mean, in terms of understanding what goes on under the hood, it's you know you've got to use something, and this definitely makes it very much easier. There, I mean, there are other FM synthesizers that try and demystify yeah, yeah. as well. So uh, Abs it's absolutely. Worth exploring. Uh, yeah, when when I when I thought about um, doing this this episode um, about FM, I was immediately thinking about DX7 and all that. And you know, there's so much is so much has been said about it. And when people, I think that when people look at at these algorithms and and all that, it's there's something very intimidating. Mm. And you have the the carriers, and you have the ratios, and you have this, and it looks very mathematical. Um, I love it because I'm, you know, um, uh, but but for many people, uh, it's still intimidating. I really like the the logic, the the f the logic interface, which simplifies it quite uh, quite immensely. Are there any sort of golden ratios, any ratios that it's like, you know, try these because these will get you, you know, certain ratios will sound beautiful, certain ratios will sound less so. I mean, that... Um, you know, I, I've been working with FM for, for many years and designing and did a lot of the presets uh, for, for this and obviously designing uh, the workflow and everything. Uh, on this and I do, I can't say that I have that there are certain magic numbers golden, <laughs> no I don't think so but but with experience you, you learn that if you want to create the tines of roads or something then you use you know you use it to like five octaves um, around five octaves above the fundamental and things like that so there's uh, certain things that you pick up along the way but uh, but it's just um you know what's nice about it is that it can do so much like the fm th synthesis in general it can do so much that it's a it's it's a really good way of experimenting and getting some unpredictable noises and and sounds right um excellent well i mean we great. could talk about fm for probably decades i mean it's been going on for that long so so i mean exactly. but but that really helps me and sort of understand a little bit more about what's going on and how those relationships work so uh, i want to say to yeah thank you ever so much for uh, giving us a bit of insight into the whole fm thing that's been a great pleasure my pleasure my pleasure <laughs>